All right, good afternoon. Hello, travelers. Welcome back to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are sharing free live stream show and tell events with members of our global community. You can find an updated calendar of live stream events and much more at at home reach the world.org. For today's show and tell, I am so excited to be ending the week this week with Sophia Kreutz. Sophia is a Fulbright scholar who recently returned from seven months working as a Fulbright English teaching assistant in Chetamel, Mexico. I hope I got it. Nice. Uh, to, our, <laughs> to our live stream viewers today, please let us know you're here and share any questions for Sophia using the YouTube chat bar on the side. We're gonna to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, I have a lot of questions for Sophia. And that said, welcome to Show and Tell, Sophia. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Sophie. And as I said, I was in Mexico for seven months um, with Fulbright and I'm here to share with you guys today a little bit of a presentation on what I learned about the Mayan culture while I was there. So I will share my screen. Okay, hopefully we're all good. All right. Looks great. Yeah. Perfect. So, buenas, kimakulaltech, util, chinkin, ink abat, sofi, e belae, tanshon, maya. So, that was a little bit in Mayan to start off with. I'm not sure if anyone has heard the Mayan language spoken before. Perhaps you have. I hadn't heard anything about it until seven months ago, and I'm hooked now. So seven months ago, I started my Fulbright grant as an English teaching assistant in Chetumal, Mexico. And I am not an expert on the Mayan culture or language at all, but I was really fortunate at my university to get to take classes in Mayan language and culture. This is a photo from one of my classes where we're learning about this tree, which is sacred in the Mayan culture. It's called Yache or Seba, and it's a really beautiful tree. So this is my class where I learned a little bit about Mayan culture and language. And I also was very fortunate to live in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So if you guys aren't sure what the Yucatan Peninsula looks like, this is a little photo of it and essentially it consists of these four main states Chiapas which is down more south like middle south of the state or the country Campeche, Yucatan and Quintana Roo. So if you need a little bit more of a popular location um, this is where Cancun is located as well as Cozumel and it's right on the southern border of Belize and Guatemala and where I lived is right here. It's called Chetumal. And what's awesome about the Yucatan Peninsula is this is actually the central hub for where the highest concentration of Mayan civilizations developed when they were in their prime. So all of these little dots you see here are archaeological zones or ruins of past cities of uh, the Mayan civilization. And these are just the bigger ones that you can visit. There are actually a ton more in the little towns all around the Yucatan Peninsula. So I was very lucky to not only take a class as well as be able to explore around um, and really get into sort of Mayan history. So to start off just a little bit of a background the Mayan civilization sort of came up in the pre-classic pre era around 2000 BC. And it was started in the southeast of Mexico where I showed you the Yucatan Peninsula, but also in um, Oaxaca, the state of Oaxaca, as well as Belize, Guatemala, and the Western parts of Honduras and El Salvador. And the Mayan civilization, they were, it was an incredible, credible civilization and they had huge sort of innovations in language and writing 
architecture, art, math, and astronomy. And we can see this a lot today when we explore old Mayan ruins. And all of these cities are unique, like the cities that we know today. So there's differences between New York and Chicago and Houston and Los Angeles. And these differences reflect the unique sort of culture of the inhabitants as well as where they are geographically located. So here are some of a, a few pictures of the cool places I got to visit. This is Ostanka, which is in Caldaritas, Quintana Roo. This is a smaller Mayan city and it's in the middle of the jungle and it's sort of taken over by plants. It's really beautiful and you have to sort of hike through to explore it. So we have these sort of hidden cities. We also have cities that rise high into the clouds. This is Kanich Kakmu in Isamal, Yucatan. This is the top of the pyramid that is actually 150 feet in the air and you can climb to the top. And the base of the pyramid is over two acres large. It's crazy and it's beautiful. We have cities that are just expansive. This is Palenque in Chiapas. And we also have some Mayan cities that reach atop the trees where you can go and just, you know, be in charge of the horizon. <laughs> this is Calakmul in Campeche. And there's also Mayan cities that are very, very wondrous. This is Chichen Itza, which is probably one of the most well-known archeological zones in Mayan ruins. It is one of the new seven wonders of the world. And it was given this title by UNESCO in 1988. And Chichen Itza is incredible. Um, so it's actually a city that reigned for about a thousand years and it had such an expansive territory with hundreds of different structures that are really, really well known today. What you see in the photo right now is the main structure. It's the Pyramid of Kupulcan or also known as El Castillo but Chichen Itza also had a very large ball court. It had a space observatory where the Mayan people observed the stars. And it also had just hundreds of different buildings that are really, really beautiful. A cool thing about Chichen Itza that we can explore today is it's, it's also the, this structure right here, the El Castillo, is the Pyramid of Kukulkan. So Kukulkan is the feathered serpent, which is a Mayan deity. And at the base of the pyramid, you can see Kukulkan is, has its head is carved into the base of the pyramid. And so one thing that's really, really cool about this pyramid is that on the equinox, so the the two periods of the equinox during the year are when the day and night are equal. And when the sun is setting during the equinox, this shadow that the sun um, casts upon the steps actually creates the body of a serpent, which ends up connecting to the head of Kukulkan at the bottom of the pyramid. And the Mayans see this as Kukulkan connecting the heavens to the earth and the underworld, which is a blessing to start the full harvest. So that's a really cool thing that we can see in Chichen Itza. This is, I was there this year in September, which was really great. And another really awesome thing that we can explore in um, El Castillo in the Pyramid of Kukulkan is this cool echoing sound. To give you a little background, Kukulkan is the Mayan de deity and Quetzalcoatl is the Aztec deity and they're the same or based on each other. They're both feathered serpents and feathered gods and they're based off the Quetzal, which is a very special bird. It's a tropical bird and it's very special in Mayan mythology and culture. And so what we can see is that if you clap really loudly at the base of the pyramid, the architecture is so that the sound mimics the chirp of the Quetzal bird. So I'll play a little bit of this clip here for you all so you can hear it. So that was our guide clapping. I don't know if you heard the echo, the bow, bow, in the background. And this is actually a recording of the true chirp of the Quetzal bird. <laughs> so
So we can hear how those two are very similar. That's one of the first sounds that I was introduced to in my exploration of Mayan history and culture. And after that, I was hooked. So let's go into a few more cool things that I found at Chichen Itza specifically, and then I will explore a little bit more of the sounds um, in general. So as I mentioned before, one of the really cool places in Chichen Itza is this ball court. Um, on your left, this is the photo. It's a little replica of the ball court. But this is where you would play a game called Juego de Pelota or Poc Tapoc in Mayan or the Mayan ball game in English. So this was a game that was played for fun or it could also be played to sort of solve squabbles or, <laughs> or fights between different tribes or groups or noblemen. And it is played by their players on two teams, and then you have to bounce this small rubber ball off your hip or leg and pass it amongst your team. And then to win, you would score a point by bouncing the ball off your hip into a ring that is about six feet in the air. And it depends on the ball court specifically how high you need to bounce the ball, but it's this wonderful game. And before I show you how it's played, this is another echoing sound that you could hear in the ball court. So on the right hand side, this is about to be a recording I'll show you of how the sound echoed when you clapped in the ball court. So that was really cool and another really awesome architectural design. So as I was saying before, the Mayan people were innovators in language and writing, but also in architecture. So all of these things are planned and just so meticulously calculated. And it's it's incredible to be able to experience those, those little wonders. And this is an example of how the Juego de Pelota, the Mayan ball game is played. And this is more of an example for historical context, but it is still played very often amongst people today. So this is a little clip. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, they were bouncing the ball off their hips, and in the very end, he made it through the hole in that ring above the court, which is really fun. So it was wonderful to be able to see that, experience that. Um, and to keep going on, as we were talking about um, ex sort of exploring the environments and how these environments add to the unique qualities of each of the cities, all of the Mayan cities, we in the Yucatan Peninsula and in the southeast of Mexico, it's mostly jungle. So we not only have all of this wonderful foliage and plant life, but there are a ton of animals as well. We heard the sound of the Quetzal bird, and I'm gonna show you a couple other animals that are really, really prominent in this area and that make beautiful sounds themselves. So in Calakmul, these are the ruins of Kalakmul, we saw spider monkeys in the tree, which was really, really cool. I zoom in here. Hopefully you can see those guys climbing through. Nice. So they were traveling in this video and things were a little bit calmer, but when they were in the trees, they would be talking and chatting up to each other and you would hear them chirping in the trees, which was really, really cool. And another monkey, which really caught me off guard, this is when I was in Palenque. These are the howler monkeys. And hopefully you'll be able to understand why they have this name after you listen to this video. <laughs> So it was a short clip, but in the background, if you heard that sound that sounded like a big cat or a growl, that is actually a howler monkey. So my friends and I were, were climbing up this, this mountain and then all of a sudden we started to hear these monkeys because it was about the time that they were eating at night. And I was freaking out. I was like, we're gonna get attacked by some sort of wild cat, but it was actually just the monkeys and it was a really, really cool sound. Um, and speaking of big cats, my, final animal sound that I'm going to share with you all today is the jaguar or the balam. And this is a very important animal in 
um, Mayan culture because the jaguar is actually the only animal that can transition between, um, sorry, they, they're the only animal that can go between worlds. So the worlds in the Mayan culture are different in day and night. So your night is where your spirits and your ancestors live and the day is for the living. So the jaguar is seen as very powerful because it can go between both of these spaces. So a lot of times the gods and the deities in Mayan culture will have jaguar aspects to them, as well as if you're a great warrior, you'll usually have a jaguar on your head sort of as your headpiece or be wearing the pelt because it's seen as a symbol of power. This is actually the throne of Kukulkan, the deity that we talked about before, the feathered serpent, and this is in Chichen Itza. So the jaguar is very, very powerful. And a cool thing to imitate this sound, because they're not just jaguars roaming around um, these, these archaeological zones when you're going and visiting, but you can get a hold of these whistles, which mimic the sounds. Um, there's the jaguar, the owl, which is really big, as well as the eagle. So I actually have here my jaguar whistle. And as you can see, you blow in the top hole and then the system, the ceramics in here make a really awesome jaguar sound. So I'll show you a little bit how you do it. You cover the mouth with your hand and then, da da dun Wow, wow, wow. So it makes a really cool jaguar sound. This is my favorite little musical instrument that I now have. And this is very true to the sound of the jaguar. So that's another important thing in making music and representing these, these animals in the Mayan culture that are very, very prominent. So to wrap up, well, not wrap up, a quick point is that I've been talking to you guys right now a lot about the Mayan culture in the past. And especially when you go to archaeological zones, it's sort of you're talking about ancient Maya, you're talking about the ruins, you're talking about what the civilizations were like. But that couldn't be any farther from the truth. A really cool thing is that Mexico is actually the second largest country of well, the population that identifies as indigenous next to Peru. So in Mexico, 21.5% of the population, which is around 25.6 million people, identify as indigenous today. These populations are mostly located near the south of the country in the states of um, Oaxaca and Yucatan. So Yucatan is where Chichen Itza is. And Yucatan has around 64% of the population that identify as indigenous. And this is going to be Yucateca Maya. And an interesting thing is of that 64%, only half also identify as being able to speak the language fluently. So I was really, really excited in my university to be able to take a class in learning Mayan language, or at least the beginnings of it. And I'm going to share a little bit with you all as well. And before we do that, another um, couple art pieces that I found in a museum of the Mayan culture today. So this is actually a sewn piece that students did in Felipe Carrillo Puerto just recently. I think it was in 2017 they made this. And it sort of, it represents the life of a Mayan um, person in Felipe Carrillo Puerto who is a it says milpero, which is essentially a farmer, an ag agricultural worker, a uh, mesero, so an agricultural worker to a waiter. So it sort of talks about this duality of being connected to your Mayan roots and being a milpero, because el milpe is a really big part of the Mayan culture, but also living as a Mayan in the current world as a mesero. So it's how you balance those two, which is really interesting. And this is another art piece of sort of all the different jobs that Mayan people have today too. And that it's not just what we may think of ancient Maya, but there are Mayans working in all sorts of fields today. So a couple ones I picked out are in office spaces, in the city, in at the home. So this is a traditional Mayan home, as you can see in the background, they're beautiful, as well as teachers. And you can see there's all different types of jobs here too, which is really wonderful. And I really love this piece. But as I said, we're going to learn a quick lesson in Mayan and it's easy as one, two, three. So it's easy as hun, 
which is one. Ga, osh. So a cool thing is the X sound is actually a sh sound. So it's not an X as we would say in English, but more of an SH, a sh. So one, hun, ka, two, osh is three, kan is four, and ho is five. And a really cool thing is all of these numbers can be represented by a series of symbols. So when you're counting, it's a lot easier to do. As we would write one, two, three, four, you would use symbols. So hun, ga, osh, kan, ho. So you can have up to four dots and then five is a line. So I'll put up a quick test to see if everyone's paying attention. What, oh, and hub is zero. Sorry. Um, so my quick test, what would this number be if we're adding up points and lines? And here's another one. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds to think about what the answer might be. Absolutely, please use this time too. If you have other questions for Sophie, put them in the chat if you have a, a guess as to what her number <laughs> and mine could be it's a great place i have a guess mm. <laughs> all right so well i think the first one we've got the two ones and then we've got the line that represents five so seven correct Ta -da! yes <laughs> <laughs> all right and the next one is I'm just going to voice what I think other people are thinking here. And we've got three lines representing 10 each plus one, so 31. Ooh, the three, the lines are a five. Oh, five, five, five. Uh -huh. Goodness. Um, yes. 16. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So it's a really fun numbering system that was cool to learn. Um, and then a couple, I'll just throw a couple more words out there in these last um, minutes. As I said in the beginning of the video, I said buenas, and buenas is just a general greeting to say hello. Gosh, this is huge. This is, okay, so the, the X again is a sh sound. So this will go gosh, gosh. And this in Chetumal, everybody said Gosh, even if you didn't identify as Mayan, it was just a phrase that was in the community all the time. And it means let's go, or it means it's like a rallying call, like, all right, gosh, you know, let's go. It's super fun. And this one is Bishabel, which is how are you? An interesting grammatical note is these double vowels that we see are actually just an elongation of the original vowel sound. So an EE -E is not gonna, we see that and we think E like in English, but it actually is more of an E. So Bishabel is how you would pronounce that. The same with Buenas, it's just an elongation of that sound. And then if you wanna get a little more tricky, Ink Aba is how you say my name is. And then if you are a female, you would put the X before your name. So like I said in the beginning, ink abash sofi. And then if you're a male, you'll put a J in front and it'll be a H sound. And then everyone in my class always made fun of me and wanted me to say these words in Mayan. So tuch is belly button and chic is armpit. Those are classics. It's you just gotta know them. <laughs> And ooh, my bad. That's a song. I would forgot. Um, this is a fun song. If you want to hear just really quickly a little bit of a rap in Mayan to hear how it sounds without my accent. Um, this is a tongue twister song. So it's it's really fun. So just listen for a quick second. Vamos a aprender trabalengua. So we're gonna learn Latino Cham. Yeah, Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to stop. Oh, Tell me when you want me to
PowerPoint, there are three other songs of different genres all sung in Mayan. If you're interested in, in listening to a little bit more of how it sounds, it's an incredibly beautiful language. So I threw those in there as well. And this is a little drawing I did to, we used buenas as a general greeting. But if you wanted to greet someone based on the time of day, which is really common, you um, can use this little chart. So the most popular is Utilkin, which is essentially good morning. And then you can go all the way to Utsil Akab, which is good night. But these are just fun ways to, to greet someone as we talked about the day and night being very important, representing different worlds in the Mayan culture. The time of day is also very important. So this is why there's specific greetings for all of these different times. So if you're interested in learning more about the Mayan language, or other indigenous languages. There are actually 62 recognized indigenous languages um, today in Mexico. There are more than that, but recognized fully are 62 and you can go um, learn more about them if you'd like. Unfortunately, they're not as popular as Spanish and French or Italian, so they're not always in schools, but there are many, many people online doing YouTube videos or PowerPoints to teach the basics to these indigenous languages. And it's really easily accessible. I threw some links up here, but also if you want to look for it too, there's plentiful amounts of opportunities to learn as well. So awesome. thank you guys so much for listening. Achumbotik. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow, Sophie, that's so much to uh, absorb there. Such a cool <laughs> culture. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious and I, I want to give, you know, anyone who's watching and there are lots of you, uh, if you have a question for Sophie, we'd be happy to pass it along. Just drop it in the chat bar. But uh, until you do that, I have so many questions. I'll, I'll start. Yes. Um, what, how did you develop an interest in my culture? I understand it's probably, you know, part and um, parcel of living in this region of Mexico. Yeah, that was this, that was the biggest pull as I went um, when I first got introduced to my university, I was walking around the campus because it's outside because we're in this tropical climate. And they had all of these signs next to the plants and signs among the grounds that had that sort of identified the plants as well as the animals that you could see. And they gave it to you in three languages. It was in Spanish, English and Mayan. And originally or just from that moment, I knew that this sort of Mayan history, but also current Mayan culture was so big in Chetumal. And I immediately wanted to learn more about it. And as I searched more and more, I found that there were just endless opportunities to learn structurally, like in a classroom, but also people that wanted to invite you into their homes and cook you traditional meals, people who wanted to show you around ruins. There are tons of of like ways for me to access this information and I just yeah. tried to get as much as I could. <laughs> it's, I'm really glad you brought up the idea that both, you know, through these archaeological sites, it feels like you're sort of <clears throat> going on a, an adventure into history, but at the same time, the Mayan culture and language are so much alive yes. that you can, you can sort of live the past and, and live the present and, and compare the same culture over a long period of time. Yeah, then that's that's a, a, a thing that definitely a lot of the indigenous populations are sort of trying to fight against. We even see that a little bit in the United States is thinking about Native Americans is always sort of talked about in a historical context when the populations are very much alive. Yeah. And if we keep talking about it and keep learning and keep promoting just and supporting these cultures, they're they can come back into larger and larger numbers and, and share all of this wonderful history and current um, traditions and, and cultures and everything. So it's, it's really wonderful, yes. <laughs> what does it feel like to be at a site like Chichen Itza and, and hear that sound? The, you played that amazing like echo sound. I have, I mean, there's so much to learn about how the minds even knew how to place that temple in the first place to create that sound. And it's so amazing that it's that has lasted intact for so, so long. What does it feel like to stand there and, and see that unfold? It's overwhelming. <laughs> I definitely had to lie to myself a little bit because you're you're so right. We live in such 
an industrialized time. There's so many machines and just technology to do all these things. And you walk into Chichen Itza and you see this pyramid that stands you know, around 90 feet in the sky. And it's made of these perfectly formed bricks. And you're, I mean, immediately my mind is just like, oh yeah, well, sure. You could make that in a second with a crane and a machine. And then you think, no, wait, that was all hand carved and hand put, you know, just labor, physical labor and making all that so long ago, you know, and, it, and it's lasted over a thousand years to be still intact at this point. And then you start thinking about the fact that it was designed so perfectly to catch the sun. So everything, nothing was a mistake. Everything was intentional in how the pyramid was angled, how it was built, the exact measurements between steps, all of that was calculated. And in, you know, 1400, or what it was, Chichen Itza was constructed between um, 415 to 455 AD. Mm. So that long ago, and it's just this incredible wonder. And it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that when you're there. So it's nice to get as much as you can, but then take pictures and notes and, you know, anything that you're thinking about and revisit that as time goes on. So you can fully sort of capture how great this place is. Yeah, absolutely. And you've given us a really great introduction to so many aspects of Mayan culture. And I especially love it through the lens of sounds because that just heightens the mystery of it all. There's so many things that, that we don't know, uh, but that are just kind of awe-inspiring. And it's a great uh, topic that I think you're going to have lots of viewers of today's live stream and of the recording sort of wanting to learn more about. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, Sophie did an amazing virtual exchange through Reach the World in which she not only shared her experiences as a Fulbright uh, English teaching assistant in Mexico, but also created this uh, great collection of coloring pages that, as I've described before, you really just have to see to believe. Uh, there is one in, in the show, but I really encourage you to go to the link that my colleague Chris has shared in the chat bar and check out uh, Sophie's entire written virtual exchange through Reach the World. It's really spectacular. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, and I guess, that, I mean, we're right at our time. I feel like we could talk for another hour, but um, Sophie, I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, I want to thank our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us as well. You can join us again next week and through uh, mid-June, we have a really incredible lineup of amazing live stream events um, that we're going to be continuing to produce. And you can find that entire calendar of events at athome.reachtheworld.org. So thank you, Sophie. I hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>